Patrick Findaro here, co-founder at Vetted Biz. Excited to have on Guy Coffee, who's not only a franchisee, he's been a franchisee for many years now, but also a franchisor. Uh, we're going to talk all about his experience, what he's doing with his franchise brand, their expansion strategies. But before I, I go in and uh, go into a lot of details about what we're going to talk about, Maybe, Guy, you could just talk a little bit about yourself and how you got into franchising. Sure. Thanks, Patrick. And thanks for having me on the show. So um, back in 2006, I was reading a trade journal uh, in the fitness industry and saw an ad for Anytime Fitness and um, got interested. Long story short, we ended up going to the headquarters and um, went there to buy one territory and walked out with six. So they were very good at sales. <laughs> and, um, and then in 2007, we started our first Anytime Fitness. And um, we still own an Anytime Fitness to this day. And we had built out five others. Um, and so going through that, we were one of the first 100 or so Anytime Fitness owners. Wow. Um, now they have over 5,000 5, clubs and um, went through that growth with them. And saw how it affected people's lives and just really liked the franchising model. And um, so we grew there. Um, my wife, Stephanie, who's the co-founder of Frenchies, um, went to work for the corporate office at Anytime Fitness. She was their first remote employee. Uh, that's what I was going to ask. Um, Did you leave beautiful Colorado to, to Minnesota? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and we have friends and family in Minnesota. So I have to be careful how I yeah. compare Minnesota to, to Colorado because um, we love Colorado too. But um, no, she was their first um, remote employee. And she started out in support and kind of rose up through the ranks Um and when they um, ended up taking, uh, purchasing another brand in the beauty industry, um, their first in the beauty industry, she um, helped bring on um, that brand and then ended up being the president for a while before she left to start Frenchies with me because I was running uh, all the Anytime Fitnesses, a nail studio, and um, not keeping up as, <laughs> as well as I should have. This is before we um, went down the franchising path with Frenchies. Um, and also in that time, uh, I had another company um, that was selling health clubs and we were preferred vendor for Anytime Fitness as well. So We've got the franchisee hat, the franchisor hat, the preferred vendor hat, the corporate employee hat, and um, you know all those different perspectives. We think you know helps us you know to to operate you know a really good business and consider all sides of any issue that comes up. So that's that's how we are. So we in 2012 we opened a nail studio. In 2015 we started franchising that concept. That was our that was our intent from from day one. And um and so we've you know we started selling in in 2016 and um, grew it and grew it. We ran into the COVID issue a little bit. And that was um, like so probably one of the hardest industries to be in. It was very difficult. And I'm sure everybody has their own challenges. And yeah. everybody thinks you know their challenges is you know. It's their own challenge, so it's um it's it's hard for everybody. But yeah, we um we had 22 studios open within six months of the COVID shutdown. Wow! And that was our first big growth growth spurt there. Um, so you know that was a, a really challenging time and um for everybody. But um, we did what we could with it. We 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 kind of we stopped all development immediately we focused on getting our our franchisees through covid and ppp and idle and ercs and all those kind of fun things um and we went to work on the project uh, on the product which was our studios so um we did a lot of um optimizing schedules and pricing and rolling out new products getting ready to roll out new products um things like that initiated our learning management system platform for our franchisees to make training new new staff members easier um we did a ton background uh work so that when we were back we were ready to go and um it really helped our our product which is our studios so the, and the the learning management is it an outside software that you're you're piggybacking on for for that? Could you tell me a little bit more? Sure, sure. You know, so you know, we have a, a workforce in Frenchies. You know, it's mostly younger, not not all, but mostly younger um, and mostly female. Um, and there is some turnover in the beauty industry. So, like, what was happening is, you know, when we didn't have an automated system in place, it was a lot of load on the manager or the owner to train the new nail technicians um, because mostly the, the beauty schools focus on hair 
you know, cosmetology and focus on hair. And they don't spend a ton of time training on nails, but a lot of people actually in that industry like doing nails better because there's, it's a conversation, um, okay. it's face to face services, yes. <laughs> you know, there's, there's lots of that. Whereas with massage or, or esthetician or something, you're talking to someone or you don't see their face or, or, you know, their eyes are closed or something like that. So it's much more social, much more engaging. Um, and you know, there's, you know, most of our, 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 our staff are creatives and, you know, there's making it pretty, making it healthy, you know, that's exciting. But the challenge is we train them. So we, you know, we'll, we'll recruit out of beauty schools. Um, and then when they come to us, a lot of times their skills aren't up to a standard that we could put them in front of a client. So we have a, a very specific, very detailed training program, but putting it on a learning management system. And we use a company called Learning Zen, who has been fantastic to work with. Um, their platform is great. Um, you know, they're, they're reasonable. They, they listen to our, our suggestions and things like that. And so I think we have over a hundred um, classes on that, that helps take the load off the manager or the owner to train new technicians on not just the technical aspect, but also the Frenchie's way of doing things, which we have a whole client experience cycle um, that everybody has to learn before they're actually put in front of clients. Um, and that's, that's helped out a ton because then if someone leaves for one reason or another, and we have to recruit someone new in, it's not like, okay, for the next you know, two weeks, this is what I'm doing. I'm training the new person. So Job shadow. it helps offload it and we can see their progress and they have to pass and those kind of things. So it helps. We don't have definitely as extensive of a learning system. We're leveraging Trainual, and we, we started doing that uh, two years ago. And it's just like, it makes everything just so much easier getting new people on and upscaling existing uh, employees where thinking about franchisors, th there's a lot of franchise systems, franchisors that are just giving the operation manual to the franchisee. And it's like, go run with it. Right. And it's just like, <laughs> right. that's kind of an antiquated way where it's like, you have this long PDF and that's supposed to be just everything to training. Every issue you have is just going to be in that PDF in a written format with no video, no audio. Nope. Nope. And you know, we, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's the old school way of doing it. It's like, See ya. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it doesn't work. It's, you know, especially in this day and age where, you know, like our, I think it, I don't think we're alone in this, you know, our number one challenge is staffing, you know, keeping up with demand. Um, so we're, you know, it's a good problem to have, but it's a, it's a problem nonetheless, um, to, to retain. Cause we see it as like, if, if the technician isn't comfortable with that client, they feel it, you know, and, you know, our whole thing is a social dynamic, um, you know, good quality service, you know, we're clean, healthy, natural. Our tagline has always been, we love clean, um, which was really came to the forefront after COVID because <laughs> um, we have a special cleaning process for our tools and, and all that. But it's something that if they're not comfortable and they don't feel like they're good at their job, it's hard to be comfortable if they care. Um, yeah. And so we think it's money well spent and, you know, to have uh, platform like that. And we have, um, a longtime team member and, uh, Kayla, um, Kayla Bramlett who does all the, the trainings on that. And she's fantastic. And she has, we have another story about K Kayla started with us when she was 17. She was a junior That's in great. high school. Now she's 24, owns her own studio and works <laughs> on the corporate team. Like talk about a, you know, a success story. I'm a big story. fan of this apprentice model. You know, it's, it was <laughs> used for thousands of years. And then I don't know, sometime in the 1900s, it just stopped being used. Yep. Like I, I don't want to yep. have an intern just for like a, a month or two. I want someone to stay on for a long time. And we've been doing and, that where interns, we call them apprentices, stay on for at least a year. But I love that model you stay on for seven years and then they have business ownership and they just yeah, they yeah. learn the ropes with you and whether they do school on the side or not you know that's up that's up to, that's their decision exactly you know it's got to be the right kind of person for sure you know it was you know that story is funny because kayla the, the first six months when we opened our nail studio um, wasn't the plan, but I ended up running it, <laughs> you know, like concierge, you know, taking appointments, doing all that kind of stuff. And, um, and I had actually told, you know, my wife, Stephanie, I'm like, like Kayla's great, um, but she doesn't talk. She doesn't talk to me at all. You know, like, you know, and, um, and then one day she came up, she's like, I'm interested in the business side of this business. And I was like, all right, all let's right. go. You know? And <laughs> so she, she learned that, um, and, you know, and just rose up assistant manager, manager, and, um, 
you know, so th those opportunities are there, right? You know, that they are all over the place for someone that's hungry for knowledge and wants to grow. And, um, you know, and we're, we're trying to create that. One of the reasons that we started Frenchies, there's a business opportunity, of course, like the, how we, how we got on. You the saw the work. industry made sense and you could differentiate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's a really fragmented industry, as you know, um, it's 99% mom and pop. And to be honest, it didn't have a great client experience, <laughs> reputation, client experience, not clean and cash business. Yep. So, yep, you know, all those I, things. Bi Biden's funding a pretty big IRS initiative that I think a lot of nail salons that are operating cash businesses, as well as other small retailers are going to be in for a shock next year. Yep. Yep. And um, yeah, the 86,000 new IRS agents might be onto that. <laughs> One or two of them it's might pretty be clear. Like You have say sales of 500 K and if you just make 20 K and they know that rents in the area aren't that high, hmm, where, where's the rest yeah. of the cash going? Right. And to be honest, I mean that, you know, that would, that would definitely help us because, you know, we do compete. So I think one of the reasons, so our, our industry um, from 2018, according to the IBIS World Report, our industry is, is always lumped in with waxing. And this is how we got onto this. My wife, Stephanie, she was looking at the industry reports when she was working for Waxing the City. And um, she's like, wow, you know, it's, it, was, it was a $12 billion industry back then. Um, but it was like 95% of it was was nails, not waxing. 95. You know? wow, and so okay. we're like, hmm, well, European Wax Center had, had like five or 600 um, IPO, studios by that point in time. company. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty successful company. They do a great job. Um, and we're like, if if they're doing that on 5% of that market, like there's definitely an opportunity for a nail, a, a nationally branded nail franchise to do it. And that's what we're still in the process of proving, right? Um, so we saw that. And then in 2018, the, the, we got a new report that it was 15 billion. And then we just got the 2021 and it shows that um, nails and waxing is a $20 billion market and 97% is nails. Huh. So it's grown. And I think, and I'm sure it's grown because, you know, despite all the, the headwinds in the, in, in the economy, our demand has never been higher. Um, you know, we, we say protect the pretty. Um, it's an affordable luxury that's going to be the one of the last things for people to, to give up. Of course, we might be a little biased in that when I say that. I, I acknowledge that. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's compelling how large it is. And I think one of the reasons that it's grown, you know, in those numbers is because a lot of the, the mom and pops are realizing like this the jig is up. We can't do as much in cash as we used to. We do no cash. We have, we have no cash. <laughs> you know, like, um, it's probably 1% of our price. And we certainly don't have a different pricing tier. Well, for also, cash. tell me, like, how is your employment structure? Is it 1099 mm -hmm. contractors or are they W-2 employees? Definitely W-2 employees. Okay. Sure. So that's an anomaly for the, the nails uh, industry where I imagine yeah. it's what, less than 5% oh, have no. W-2 employees? California yeah. is leading the charge, but it's a it's a tidal wave occurring across the U.S. Whether it's nail salons, barber shops, you name it, on the service side. Yeah, if you dictate you know, if you, hours and you dictate certain things, that becomes an yeah. employee. And we we did that right from the start because one of the you know one of the besides the the obvious you know like business are there to make profit that's their job, um, but the other one was to change the culture in that in that industry and make make provide a really good place for the for nail professionals to work. We do stuff that is completely an anomaly. Like, you know, we share numbers with our team. Um, every, every bonus is based on a team bonus, like how the studio performs, not how like one that. person performs. Um, and what it did and what it's done is we think, and we've kind of seen and experienced is it does create a team atmosphere. So it's not like two people edging each other out for that big tipper, you know, that's coming at two o'clock or something like that. <laughs> like <laughs> there's not as much of an issue there because they know it's all going towards the same goal. And then our team gets bonused on, on how the studio performs. And in, in order to do that, we have to share the numbers with them. Um, you know, not every number. I'm not saying we go through all our expenses with them, but like the top line numbers. And that's one of the things that I was surprised of in this industry is how much data there is and how it's, you know, it's data driven. Um, and we've, we've been able to, to utilize that, um, just cause we have that, you know, that expertise on our team, um, to, to really improve the business. So I was looking at some, some numbers from 2018, um, and it, that, that, you know, published numbers and our, 
And our average ticket price back then was $34.67. Okay. Okay. So I compare it to, I just pulled the numbers yesterday and, um, you know, our average ticket price is $67. That's wild. Now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, going through looking at annual unit volumes of studios, which is what a lot of valuation is based on. It's really, really helped. And, you know, the higher the ticket price, generally, the more the, the, the service technician makes as well. So, um, you know, and the other thing that we're a little bit different is, you know, we don't do acrylics. Um, which is what most people associate the scent in a nail studio with. Um, they're really bad. They have, there's tons of studies showing how bad it is um, for for people. And um, so we've always said that we're, we don't do acrylics. Um, and you know, and that is for the safety of the people that are in there for eight hours. You know, Good. just as much as the person that's visiting for an hour. Yeah. You know, so. That, that was another differentiator, like clean, natural, and healthy as much as we can. There's certainly some chemicals involved because we can't do everything, you know, totally natural. Well, you're doing but, everything for the long long run. I mean, if yep. I'm sure you could have been very successful just opening up more fitness studios um, and then maybe growing corporate locations. But going into franchising, it, it is for the long run. And, you know, you have to have a certain unit count for you to really get the, the payback on your time. So... It seems like everything you've done is like for the next 10 years, 15 years and building up to that moment. Absolutely. Yep. That was, you know, the, the vision that Stephanie and I had for this is to, to, you know, to change an industry. Like we were always, always had our radar up just because we saw how much franchising changed a lot of the people in our lives, like especially anytime fitness owners, um, you know, and the ones that were successful, which was a lot of them. And, you know, and so when I was when I was reselling anytime fitnesses, you know, I sold them for top dollar and I sold them for less than asset value. And almost every time the people that were selling for less than asset value had a reason, <laughs> you know, like it doesn't work in my town. It doesn't work here. It doesn't work with my competition, things like that. And meanwhile, you know, most of the people were doing really well with it. Um, and, you know, I think it was something you said uh, on, on one of your shows a while ago. It's like, I think one of the main reasons people get into franchising is control, control their own schedule and, you know, and control their life. Well and, said. you know, they have a little bit more control over their success or failure. Right. Um, and, you know, so we've seen it used in the best way possible and created great lifestyles for the the owners and their families and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's also, and which is, you know, one of the great things that your, your business does with vetted biz and, you know, in this, this podcast is it's, it's a huge risk too. Right. And like when people go into this, if it fails, it's, it's not like, uh, eh. You can't shrug it off. It's you feel it. Yeah, it's like you a have downside liability. If you generally signed a, a long term lease, and there's also a long term contract with the with the franchise or right, right. You know, and so you know, it's it's really important to succeed. You know, a lot of the eggs are in one basket at that point in time. You know, and that's why um, you know resources like you you provide and the IFA provides and things like that is like I really believe, bottom of my heart is like if unless it's some crazy franchise that you know it's it's really which is hard to do it would be hard to do it, that's in there just to rip people off you know like I really believe that if people like really dig in really get into it like surround themselves with information and people and connections which is totally possible in this day and age just listening to Spotify podcasts and reaching out to the IFA and talking to other people around you that are in the same boat. Cause there's a lot of people in the same boat that the resources are there and you can be super successful in franchising. So that's, that's our main experience in it. And we wanted to provide that as well as a good environment for a lot of people that work in this industry. And to be honest, nails industry has not been the most highly regarded in terms of, you know, exploitation you know, on a large scale and, and a my and a minor scale too. You know, we hear stories to this day about stuff going on in like some of the mom and pops that's like you can't do that. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> we're like, why are you working there? Um, and you know, just to provide a an outlet for that. And and so we've seen other franchise systems come into our same kind of space, you know, and um, which is you know, mid-market. You know, we're not a day spa where it's, you know, really expensive, but really great at client experience. And we're certainly not the like express nail salon where, um, 
you know, where you're going to get a, a really low price, but a really bad client experience. We're like mid market, you know, we say, um, and that's where we, we, we fit. And there's been some other players that have come into that market. Um, and we think it's fantastic because yeah, it's it validates been, and, and educates the consumer of the differentiation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's harder. I think there's a little bit of a social pressure for people to like, yeah, you know, cause just a few years ago, the, the cheapest place in the country to get a manicure and a pedicure was Manhattan, huh. New York. That's absurd. Because, <laughs> you know, everything's cheap in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> you got a New York, you know, background, right? So, you know, nothing's cheap there. But it's because they, you know, there was massive exploitation of the workers, Jeez. right? Um, and not paying taxes and things like that. Um, so, you know, yeah, someone can say like, yeah, I got a manicure and a pedicure for $28. Like now someone might say to them like, well, you know, the person who did that service didn't get paid and they're probably sharing an apartment with 12 other people. How do you feel? Yeah. <laughs> Glad you exactly. saved that money, you know? Um, so a little social pressure. We don't say that in the studio or anything like that, but you know, it's there. But people you know, should forward. be informed about that. And then they they make their own decisions. Um, uh, going back to the employee side, I'm sure a lot of your franchisees were super thankful to have W2 properly uh, contracted employees. <laughs> Because oh, yeah. all these programs, if if they weren't employees, you didn't really benefit. PPP, yeah, the two rounds of P, PPP, employer retention credits. I mean, we're talking, imagine some of your franchisees in a one year could get $50,000, $70,000 that uh, we, we had a couple of rounds of PPP and it's basically just additional revenue to your business and it's it's tax that way you pay you'll pay taxes on it but it's a government right. grant and and that can really make a big difference yeah absolutely and having that and so in our in our system we also you know we learned some things when we when we started with anytime fitness you know it was early days you know chuck and dave were you know, that those are the founders were you know they were just selling 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 and <laughs> you know it's great like and we were we benefited hugely from it so like but in the beginning you know, they're, they weren't sophisticated. Like our, our design book was, uh, find 4,000 square feet, buy a bunch of purple paint and make sure one <laughs> of the bathrooms has a shower. Right. And now anytime That's fitness, so you know, it's owned by self-esteem brand. I mean, they have design books and there's something for everything. I mean, it's fully, fully blown out. You know, it's just a part of their growth. There, there's definitely like a time you ideally want to be getting in on the, the franchise train. And we, we saw oh, that yeah. with like, in, in your adjacent state in Utah, crumble cookies, where it's gone up and up and up. And who knows if the average unit volume will dive or if the build out costs just keep going crazy. It's not even available in most states. And right. with Orange Theory here in South Florida, where it used to be like 250, you could open up a studio. Now it's like one one million, one point two million to open up a studio. Still makes kind of the same amount of money. So yep. and there's not much market left. So it right. definitely, I don't know if you've seen that with other systems where there is that period, like you jumped in anytime fitness, potentially the most ideal part. Maybe a little late, maybe a little too early. But I mean, right. if you're not in that in that period where there could potentially be great growth mm -hmm. and you're too late to the game, you know, you could be paying a really big price to enter in because they want to maintain their brand a lot more. And and to do that, the cost goes on the franchisee, how the build out and everything set. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, so I mean, we've lived it. You know, like when, when we walked out after uh, Chuck talked to us for an hour, like back in 2006 <laughs> around Christmas time um, and ended up buying six territories, we, we paid less for six territories than you can buy one for now. Oh, right? wow. You know, um, and you know, the, the same thing is true of, you know, those other examples you gave. It's because, you know, they get more sophisticated and they provide more value and they, you know, and things like that. I just re-signed our, our third time I've re-signed our Anytime Fitness, you know, um, franchise agreement. You know, it's nothing like the first one I signed, but it's still worth it. You know, it's still worth it. So it's, it's like, okay, it's still, a, it's still a value, you know, like it's also at this, this point in time you know, a lot more people know about it, you know, the anytime fitness. So we get that and we get the reciprocity and things like that. So that helps, you know, and the, you know, the reciprocity is a big deal for us, um, in that. And we also have it in Frenchies cause we have a membership program, Oh, nice. you know, so if someone doesn't have time to, you know, get their final 
you know, nail manicure or pedicure before they go down to Florida for a vacation, they can go to a location there. Oh, that's um, very and cool. And they just walk in and yeah, it started out with, um, you know, we did series in the beginning to see how that went, would go. And then we switched to a membership model. And now I think we have over 4,000 members. Um, just in our, and you know, that's going to draw system. further collaboration and community across the franchisees. It seems like you've already built that at the corporate side, and then with the employees on the on the franchisee unit level side. But now across the franchisees, there'll probably be more free flowing information that eventually goes up to you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we have we have a share we have a bookkeeping system that everybody has to to be on, so we we know how everybody's doing. We can see everything. Um, it helps with ranking and stacking because people. It's so funny. It doesn't matter if, you know, who it is. I think if they're human, they want to know how they compare. Definitely. You know, if there's any like, competition. Little, little, yeah. A little competitive streak in everybody, hopefully. Right. Um, and so we can rank and stack on just about any parameter you can think of. You know, I mean, we, we use our, our, our main KPIs of, you know, for franchisors average. that are listening, whether emerging or established franchise or brands, what are the most important metrics that you're tracking on franchisees? Yeah. So for us in the beauty industry, um, average ticket is huge um, because we do pay on an hourly basis plus tips and bonus. So that's a huge one. Um, of course, average unit volume for annual unit you know, volume on a yearly basis. For us, rebooking percentage is gigantic. So huh. in the beginning, um, and these are things, you know, so re re rebooking percentages is a gigantic one um, because that provides predictability. Um, of course we do, we track membership sales because that provides even more predictability, you know, because it's a number that's not going to go like this. It's going to go like that. Right. Um, and then, um, you know, we have a leaderboard that comes out every month and people, you know, we used to be like really careful about, oh, you know, like people don't want to get noticed or, or anything like that. And now we're like, no, like you got to get noticed, you know, so um, we'll have <laughs> highest revenue, we'll have highest rebook, we'll have highest retail. Because one of the things that we've done in the industry is um, before retail was not a big part of it. Because to be, you know, to be honest, lots of times there was a, a language barrier, and you know, some of these things they need to be sold. You have to talk about them to sell them. Um, and so, what we do is we have we have our own Frenchies branded product line um, in the studios that we use for the back bar and the professional services. We also have those for sale um, in retail, um, uh, you know, retail merchandise. Um, and so, you know, we'll do seven to ten percent of our revenue in retail, um, which is you know, good margin. Um, you're paying rent on the space anyway. You might exactly. as well sell something out of it, you know? Um, and then, you know, when we, when we launched our own line a couple of years ago, um, it lowered our franchisees costs, which is our first thing, you know? So I remember, you know, back in the day, um, Chuck would always say like, we have three hats. I wake up every morning, I got three hats. You know, what's good for the, what's good for the brand, what's good for the franchisee and what's good for our clients, you know? And so we think of those three things all the time, but for us, you know, we, we always put the franchisee, you know, like houses help the franchisee, um, because without them, we don't have a system, <laughs> you know? So that was our first thing is like, okay, we can lower the, the supplies cost by creating our own line and distributing it ourselves. And then, you know, and then we also have Frenchies sitting in people's showers, you know, and with our sugar scrubs or, you know, in the bathroom. They're reminded. The yeah, They're reminded to go awareness. to the physical location for more product yeah. or more service. Yeah, exactly. You know, and um, we just did a, a little pilot on direct to consumer, just we, like literally just launched it um, just to see, make sure we had the, you know, the mapping set out for technology, you know, for, for ordering and fulfillment and, and all that. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Like, so we do a lot of things to try them out in small quantities or small time frames, And then we make a decision like that, eh, that worked or it didn't work. Yeah. You but, have the metrics. You don't want to be yeah. a dead horse, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? So, yeah. So it's, you know, it's that, that was one of the other things that we did during, you know, COVID is like, we, we got to create our own product line and find the right manufacturer. And luckily for us, you know, we have a really good vendor mix. Um, that we really rely on and try to partner with. We just, we just had a, a fundamentals training here in, in Denver um, and um, had a really good turnout for it. Our owners came, they brought one of their key managers. It was kind of cool. neat because in this industry, there was, there was two people in the room that had never flown before. Yeah. 
And there was a bunch of people in the room had never been on a business trip. Oh, wow. That's cool. You know, every, you know like, like you forget, it. you know, like yeah. you're not as old as me, but like you forget because we've been like flying and doing everything. Training, for so educations, long. networking. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Yeah. So to be in the room with people that this is their first thing and you that's know, a serious and experience it. you're sharing with them. And the franchisees. Right. Yeah. And think about them going back, you know, to, to they're going to tell a lot of people about friends. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So you, you see that and the, the excitement and everything like that. It's like, ah, it's another reason we do this, you know? So it's kind of cool. What's like the breakdown between subscriptions and just drop in? Yeah. So, you know, our memberships, I think we have, well, a little over 4,000. So, um, you know, and some, some studios have more than others. Um, and it's actually interesting because some people, some owners like it more than others. Some people are like, I want to put as much on on um, memberships as possible because then I know I have that revenue coming in. Correct. Because, you know, and you're paying the employees month. anyways, so you can probably easier yeah. manage the business. Yeah. Right. Um, but most of our studios are on an appointment only basis. We'll take walk-ins, but um, you know, with our rebook percentage, as I said, like in the beginning, we were hoping for 10 to 15%. Now we have most of our studios are between 40 and 50%. Wow. It's sick. Rebook. Yeah. It's, it's a huge driver of predictability. Yeah. Um, you know, and if someone needs to cancel, if they give us 24 hours notice, we're, we, you know, we, we work with them, you know, we're not ruining our experience with them over one missed appointment. Life happens. Right. But I would say we're probably 95% appointment. Um, and then we have the walk-ins and then, um, you know, we have, um, we have a terrific, um, partner called true lark that we work with. It's a, it's an AI appointment setting system. <laughs> um, so it's amazing. Like when I was making an appointment for myself, when we first, I'm like, I cannot believe they're asking me these detailed questions and it's all AI, you know, so funny. like which studio do you want to go to? You know, what, what service, what level do you want? Like everything. And then like, oh, it's not available at that time. And it gave me like two other options. <laughs> this is unbelievable. So um, that's another thing that we're trying to, you know, roll out to make it easier for ownership and management. So a lot of that is taken care of. Obviously, we still pick up the phone, but, um, but you know, a lot of it is, is automated. And, um, you know, and we get called, you know, of course, on Thursdays, we start getting the calls like, I'd like to get in tomorrow or Saturday or, you know, it's like, oh. How about a week from tomorrow exactly. or Saturday? It's a good weekends are are really busy, you know. So our, you know, we know what the cycle is, and you know, we try to, you know, try to try to staff accordingly. But you know, you, and you how do you so roll out people. initiatives, testing out sales and marketing initiatives or even product yeah. initiatives? Do you do it just at your corporate location? A couple of franchisees act as guinea pigs. How, how do you handle yeah. that? Yeah, well, it's interesting. So. Um, Good question. Um, so most of it we do at our corporate studio. We're the guinea pig. We find out, either get the benefit of a great idea <laughs> or to pay the price of a, it's a lot of not so great Yeah, idea. you're bearing a lot of cost. This whole yeah. research and development. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. We do. Um, but it's uh, there's also been times where um, you know, we just know from being franchisees that sometimes the best ideas come from the field. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, you know. Just as a quick aside, one of our best-selling retail products was the idea of one of our nail technicians from eight years ago. She's like, I, you know, I used to sell this stuff, you know, at this studio, and we're like, oh, let's try it out, and it's a fantastic project product, um, and it sells really well, and it, I mean, it's it just works, and I wouldn't have known about it except for having a conversation with a nail technician, right? Um, but sometimes, you know, if someone wants to really try something out, um, we have a pilot program. Um, system where like, okay, you can try that out. You have to share your data with yes. us. You know, we, we need to know the pros and the cons, cool. you know, we're going to use it for 90 days. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to um, make a decision based in the first 30 because it, you know, jumped out of the box because you have pent up demand, right? Like we have a pilot going on right now down in, in Tampa, Florida. Um, we're just about to roll up the data on it. It looks really promising. We're super excited about it because it'll actually raise our average ticket price. Um, but we got to look at all of it. Um, also in terms of client experience, if you can't have a team of 14 nail technicians and only have one, 
be able to do the service because yeah. the people that want the service are not going to, are not going to wait that long. So you have to have, you know, the plan and what the expenses are going to be to train everybody up to that acceptable level, hopefully exceptional level. Um, so we look at all that stuff and we, we say no more than we say, yeah. Um, but the times that we say, yeah, it, it's a winner, right? Yeah. You know, you so the we data to back it up. Totally. Yeah. So we did that, um, a couple of years ago with a product called gel X it's, it's, you know, our biggest thing is we don't do acrylics. Like those are the really long nails usually it's, that you see that that's the, the smell that everybody associates with normal nail studios, which a Frenchie's does not smell like that. Um, it smells like lavender or vanilla or something, depending <laughs> on <laughs> what's been open recently, um, of our products. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, we piloted that really, really hard. It, you know, it passed with flying colors. We've rolled it out in the studios and it's a healthy alternative to acrylic nails. Um, so people can get the length they want, but it's, you know, still porous. So your, your, your nail bed can still breathe and more technical stuff than, than I ever thought I would know about cuticles and nails and (laughs) things like that. But, um, so it's, it's healthy, you know, and that's the biggest thing. Um, and it's not, you know, detrimental to the health of the people applying it all day, nor the people wearing it. Um, and that's been a huge, uh, huge success for us. Um, and it's, you know, it's helped raise our average ticket price and, um, the profitability of the studios. So raising the average ticket price, how, how do you, like, it's a certain customer that's also going to be paying like a certain price. Like what, what has been your best customer acquisition strategy like over the last year or two? Is it just hmm. organic SEO, Google ads? Hmm. What, what's been the best way to get customers? Oh boy. Um, my VP of marketing is like, I don't, <laughs> you know, I should answer that question, not you, because a lot of that's, to be honest, sure. goes over my head. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, the average ticket price, tell me if I answer your question right. One of the reasons, one of the ways that we've done it is, you know, we've raised prices, of course, to, to go along with inflation and all that. Um, we've also added on some services that add um, slight product costs, but not a lot of time. Time is our our, our main constraint. Right. Um, and so, you know, we have a terrific CBD service. Um, we partner with a great company Hmm. on that. Um, we have an anti-aging service that doesn't take a lot of time, but the product works really well. Um, so those average on, cause those are like add-ons to the service. Um, but in terms of client acquisition, um, you know, there's, I can't get into the nitty gritty just cause not, I'm not trying to be vague or evasive. It's just that that's, that's VP of marketing. There's experts. Department. You Stacey. hire experts. Yeah. 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 But you know, a, a lot of, um, Facebook um, I know we have a, a really good offer on Facebook for folks nice. where they get a certain work discount well. on their first visit. And then it's up to the studio to make, make sure that they provide an excellent service and they follow up correctly. Um, I think one of the bigger things that we do in the industry um, is, you know, we have follow up. So first time clients, uh, we have a client experience cycle that was helped. Um, we used uh, a gentleman named uh, the services of a gentleman named John DeJulius, um, customer client experience expert. So he's done it for like Starbucks and Four Very Seasons. Cool. And I was introduced to him through Anytime Fitness. Um, and his company helped us create our client experience cycle. Um, so we do some things that are a little bit different than what people expect when they go into a nail studio. So if there's a first time client, they get a tour of the studio front and back because hmm. we've been in the back of some nail studios and it's not a pretty sight. So you <laughs> so. just hit like every reason why someone might say no. Like you're just yep. like whether it's social proof or the cleanliness, everything. And then there's no reason that they would say no to, to sign up We're, again. Yeah. The biggest thing is be a no risk business, you know, yeah. like there's no risk. Like if someone doesn't like their service, they can say like, I didn't like this service. We don't get that, but they could, you know, and we, we refund them. Also, you know, if you get a tour of the whole place, our places are 1500 square feet. This is not a big, yeah. you know, <laughs> a big time investment, but it does like, Oh, they know what the back room looks like. And everybody knows the back room is usually the dirtiest place in a business or a house or whatever. And they see it. They're like, everything in here is really clean. I like clean. the transparency. Everything is organized, right? And then what we do for first-time clients is, you know, we touch them a bunch of times. So postcards, phone calls, texts, thanks for your thing. You know, thanks for your... Thanks for your. I like um, the f- 
print is it like the medium i love that strategy of direct mails like it's just it's underutilized and and i really i always remember like when i get the last few mails i physically have gotten like over the last couple of weeks i i can recall the company at least that was sending it yeah but with email and other methods not as much right yeah if it's handwritten um you get a postcard you know the postage is cheaper it's less to write to be honest with you just like hey thanks you know we appreciate you coming in looking forward to your next visit you know another frenchies thing hit in their mailbox. Um, and you know, that's one of the easy things for us to do is differentiate just yeah. through reaching out to people, you know, especially if, if they've already spent money with us and they know, um, what the experience was like, it just makes sense. And we make it easy, you know, so that, you know, we have the postcards, we have them, you know, pre, pre, pre postage, you know, up, um, the nail technician, we do ask them to just write it themselves and then pop it in the mail. So it's easy. It's nice. It's a nice touch. And for prospective franchisees, those that are listening and valuing different businesses, what's your ideal franchisee look like? Like what's what's their liquid capital, net worth, background, men, mindset? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the the, the financial requirements um, were, were fairly inexpensive for a, a franchise, you know, if you're comparing it to a restaurant franchise or yeah. something like that. But, um, you know, it's um, it's 150 um, liquid 500 net worth, you know, the best background, that's a really good question because I'm just thinking of our, our top performing franchisees. Um, you know, we have one franchisee in our whole system that has a background in beauty. So that is definitely not necessary, but it certainly does help her. She does really well. (laughs) Um, you know, she's used to the challenges and, and, and has been down that path before. So it certainly helps. Um, we have, uh, a couple of husband and wife teams that perform really well. You know, maybe one of them's in operating the other one's more on the business. Very cool. Um, financially in the background. Um, and that's, it's, it's interesting because it's not, oh, you know, the lady is in the, in the studio and the gentleman is, you know, back, back doing the numbers. It's sometimes it's switched Inverse. the other way. Right. And people that are, you know, what, one of the themes is people that are super social. Um, there is a little bit of a, well, I, I call it the rock star cachet of owning the nail studio that people know, you know, cause you know, if you do a good job, you get a lot of social power in I that, can see that. Uh, you know, a little stardom, um, you stick out. Um, but it's people that have uh, generally and also that are the really... gatherings. I imagine there's a ton of bachelorette parties and like little oh, yeah. parties that are happening at the studio. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So someone's super social, loves, loves being around people. Um, there is with our workforce, there's, there's like a, a fine line between like, I want to help these people out, but you also got to provide guidelines, you know, like what's acceptable, what's not acceptable in terms of their career growth, you know, things like that. Um, People that were really involved in their community before and want to give back in a bigger way um, because, you know, you do employ a number of people um, that are generally not all the time. You know, I don't want to um, forget about the people that have been in the industry for a while and are doing a great job. Exactly. But um, we do have a lot of people that are younger in the industry. And frankly, the reason there's there's not a lot of older people in the industry is because they get burnt out, you know, because they're working on commission. They don't want to take a break for lunch. They don't want to do this. They want to make money while the client's there and they're they're getting run by the business rather than the other way around. Um, You know, there's been no, no thought given to ergonomics for, for people in the industry because they're like, Oh, it's, you know, they're, they're super flexible. They, some weird position <laughs> don't worry about it without they don't need out. good chairs. You know, like <laughs> that's, that's not how we operate. So hopefully we get people that can stay in the business longer because it is unbelievable. I did not know this before I got into this, the physical aspect that a nail technician has to work. I mean, they're like doing detailed work when they're doing pedicures, they're lifting uh, legs up, you know, working people around, um, you know, so that they can get the perfect job done. Um, and it's, it's more physically exacting or, you know, exertion than I ever thought there would be, um, that and the data part of the business really surprised me. Um, but getting back to your question, someone that's involved in the community, they like talking with people. Um, they like leading people. They want to have employees are we talking about once the business, uh, get sizable, like after the like, third year? Yeah. Like 10 to 15, you know, yeah, so it's um, all a number. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not huge, but it's, you know, it's not two or three, like we have in like our any time fitness yeah. model or anything like that. So there, there's a, a number of people and number of personalities to work with. So you have plenty, plenty of opportunity for that, but 
the good thing is, you know, it's a, you, you can have an impact because um, there's usually not a lot of other places for people to land and get treated the right way. Um, and the appreciation level is actually there for the most part. Well, I'm so sure just over it time, it's going to be word of mouth customers, word of mouth for employees and the acquisition yep. cost to get that employee acquisition and cost to get that customer drops down. And then the franchisees are more profitable. Right. Right. And we're looking forward to, you know, you're, you know, we're in the present, but we're always looking forward to the, to the, um, you know, the growth when there's 500, 600 Frenchies in the, in the country. You know, I always say right now we're, we're coast to coast because we have one in Ventura and we have one in Tampa, right. but there's lots of spaces in between. So yeah. don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but you know, down the line is, you know, it might also be another one of those things where, Hey, you know, if you're, you know, if you've been working at the Frenchies, you know, in California and you happen to be moving to Texas, man, the Frenchies there, like, you know, all our systems, you know, our software, you know, our protocols, just go there. Right. You know, like, Hey, great. Less recruiting for that Texas, you know, studio owner to have to do. It gives them something, it gives them a a roadmap, something to look forward to. Um, Like you mentioned with one of your earlier employees that started at 17 and that there's a clear growth trajectory in their career and that they can bounce around, whether it's a a horizontal move, but they're, they're learning and it's a different area or if they're transitioning to to business ownership. Absolutely. We, we, we did want to provide a career path for people and, you know, the bigger that we get, the easier that will be. But we do things even even now because you can't just put off things for when we're bigger, right? Um, so we have like micro projects. If someone's interested in something like that, like go for it. Let's see what happens. You know, we'll provide support. Um, let's see where that goes. If they want to test out a vendor, if they want to test something out, um, or if they want to get more involved in one aspect of the business, they can look at that. Um, so, you know, we'll have someone take on a nail technician that's really into social media, like, okay, a few hours a week, you know. So we, we have this because we have a younger workforce workforce, like someone, um, is off, you know, um, on maternity leave or something like that, but they still need money. Um, and we can't do it for everybody all the time, but you know, if it's been an employee that's been really good to us, um, we'll give them some home projects like that Hmm. because believe me, I'd much besides Stacy, our VP of of marketing, I really, I'd much rather have uh, a 22 year old handling my Instagram stuff than me. And now TikTok, (laughs) it's like, there's always some new channel to, that you can get clients from customers from. Right. Yes, exactly. You know, so, um, things like that, you know, that provide like, oh, this is interesting. You know, they're not just hands, you know, that go into, to do services. They've also got personalities and brains and, and if they have a desire to learn something or try something out, we try to give them that opportunity. So that, that goes a long way as well. That being said, you know, you know, it's, it's not all rainbows and and ponies, you know, like there's, we're working with people and personalities and people make crazy decisions sometimes. People are irrational. Some, yeah. 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 So, but you know what, at the end of the day, or people leave, like we have one of our, 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 uh, nail technicians for our corporate studio. She was with us for seven years and she went off to start her own studio, hmm. you know, and, um, and she felt comfortable enough to tell us that. Um, and we support her and we're still friends with her and it's like, yeah, go for it. Right. You know, it's, that that's what you want to do. It's, it's fine. Like when someone goes and grows and they can do something else with what you've taught them, you can't take that as a negative. That's, Definitely. And I'm kind of, happy for that. Yeah. Yeah. Now if she would have gone and opened it to Frenchies. I would have been much happier, yeah. but, she, you know, <laughs> but, but, but you know, that's, that wasn't the path for her. So, you know, we're, we're, we're looking. So as I mentioned, we're, you know, we stopped development completely when COVID happened, we had done pretty well with that. Um, focused, um, our product is a lot better now. It's more attractive. Um, and we're just getting ready to start development again. I so it. it's um, responsible. And we're excited about that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of companies just sell, sell, sell. But the fact that you took basically two and a half years off from franchise development to improve your internal processes. Uh, yep. that, there was a sacrifice there, I'm sure. But again, yeah. you're, it seems like you're in it for the long run. So over the next 10 to 15 years, it will bear fruit. Yeah, absolutely. Like even when we're, you know, I was looking at, you know, some of the, the ratios and and things like that. It's like when you're our size, you know, which is not huge. Um, if you have some closures, which we did, you know, due to COVID and all that, 
it just looks horrible. You know, like, so it's like, well, let's have a conversation. You know, it, it was horrible, you know, but it's, but it's, there's a reason for it, you know, and we can well, get it was over the first it. economic crisis that you've passed through as a franchise or where now I'm sure franchisees need to have more working capital needs. You're more probably stricter on that net worth requirement, liquid capital. So we're all we're absolutely. always learning. And yeah, absolutely. And, um, and, you know, and then on our side, you know, just cause we don't, you know, we're not like, it's all their fault or anything like on our side, you know, our, our challenges, we know if someone's doing the right thing, um, and they're treating their team, right. And they're treating the clients, right. That it's going to grow. That's beauty. Basically yeah. it, it's kind of a slower growth compared to what we were used to with fitness where it's like, boom, out of the box, you kind of see where you're going. Um, so we know it's going to happen, but what, our challenge was to ourselves is like, how do we make it happen faster? Like we got to get them there faster. That's on us because yes. they can't do it. Right. And so we took that to heart and, you know, our, I mean, I'll tell you like our first studio that opened back in 2016, our first franchise studio, we had 14 appointments on the books day one. Hmm. And we're like, that's awesome. Yeah. You know? It's serious. So, yeah. yeah, no, but now recently, you know, how much now, now it's, now it's, you know, we have two, 300, you know, huh. booked in the first week. Oh, wow. um, okay. So we know how to do the grand opening better. Yeah. We know how to, you know, spend the money better, things like that. And, you know, it's, we, as a franchisor, we've also learned some things that are, you know, we see some of the, the normal trends um, that happen um, as people are going through the construction process. You know, I learned some of this through any time, you know, they would like our, you know, our franchise coach would, Cause we built a few of those, you know, and they would, they would nail it every time. Like you got to focus on marketing, keep on focus on marketing. And I'd be like, yeah, but the flooring's coming biggest, in today. And the biggest I mistake there. I see with franchisees is they try to, they try to save penny, well, relative pennies, but do the minimum spend. And it's like, dude, allocate 10 K. This isn't a thousand dollar thing. You already spent 300,000. It's yep. not going to make a big difference. Like you're going to get a return on investment. Because other yeah. people have already got in that return on investment when they do the the marketing fund. Absolutely, but what most people, I mean, and I've been in this boat is, you know, there's a certain point before you open where it's just big check after big check after big check that yeah. you're writing and you have zero revenue. It's just a psychological thing. Like Boy. money's leaving, money's leaving. <laughs> like I don't have to pay for that, you know, catalog ad or that, you know, mailer ad or, you know, or whatever it is, but I do have to pay for the flooring that's coming in. So I got to write that check. And, and so I actually, you probably know who this is. It, there might be more than one, you know, it, but there's a system out there that kind of holds back. Uh, a portion of the money. And they say like, we are spending this money on your behalf during grand opening. And it's like, yeah, $10, well, $10. even like some smart contractor escrow would be great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a natural like hesitancy to keep spending before the revenue comes in yes. and it's the worst time to stop. Yes. Right. You know, so our grand opening, we used to not have a minimum grand opening spend. And then we switched that, you know, and so now I think it's 15,000. Okay. Um, yeah. And, but people get out of the box way faster. They get off zero way faster. They ramp up way quicker. Well, and then they're yeah, not you can going just do the capital. calculations. It's like you could lose like a few months rent. Like you're basically, you're, you're a time crunch. And like you said, as a franchise where you're trying to condense the time to build out, time to break even, time to make, you know, 5K plus and earnings. So everything yep. you can do to condense that, that time. Is huge. Yep. That window has got to be shorter. And so that's, that's, you know, that all goes to, you know, getting more people in the door, spending, spending smarter, making sure that our, you know, our, our brand is on target. Um, and those kind of things where, um, it all rings true. People try us out. Hopefully we wow them with the experience and go from there. We just finished, um, Stacy, our VP of marketing just finished a brand survey study. It was really interesting. So we sent a survey out to 104,000 um, people, um, mostly former clients or current clients as well. Number. Yeah. Yeah. And so we did one of these back in 2018 and we sent it out to like 5,500 people. <laughs> yeah, so like the growth has been, you know, really, really cool that way. Um, and the reason we did it is just <clears throat> kind of a report card on ourselves um, and our studios as well. But mostly for ourselves is like, is our brand value? Is that actually being seen and experienced in the, in the market? 
you know, and, you know, how is it for the team members? Because we also surveyed current and former team members, like, how are we doing there? Right. How's the studio doing there? Um, and the results were, were fantastic. You know, we, we got to hear a lot of, you know, things that we wanted to hear, you know, so that was good, but there was also learnings in there, you know, and, um, some of the things, you know, that we might change and some that are like, mm, that's just who we are. We're, we're not, we're not going away from this core value of ours. Um, you know, some of that is, you know, some of the services that do involve acrylics and things sure. like that. It's like, holy cow, you know, there's, there's a service out there. It's called it's called dip. I'm uh, giving you way too much nail information, but it's called dip services, you know, dip nail. And I've heard it from my wife, some of these services. <laughs> so the thing is, you know, m- m- a couple of the bigger companies that are, that do that, if they know it's chopped up, it's, it's ground up acrylics huh. that you dip your finger in, but even in their marketing, they say it, it's safer than acrylics. Oh it's my like, God. It's, it's acrylics. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, and most people don't even know it, you know? And so, but, you I'm know, sure one time it will take, like, it'll probably take three years, but I'm sure the FTC will be all over them or some, some agency. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, hopefully in a, in a way, right. Yeah. You know, I'm not great. For, I'm not huge on government overreach, but I'm also like, well, that's just blatantly the not consumer true. should. Yeah. So it's yeah. oddly, um, yeah, the consumer in a perfect world, the consumer would have all the information, but there is a big asymmetry. Right. Right. And in most people don't even know it that are getting it. And it's a, in, in, in terms of wear and looks and everything, it's yeah. a fantastic service. Sounds a the lot like the is, supplement space to me. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Here, here, you know, take this ephedrine as much as you want. Like, no, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, there's, you, you know, there was some things like that. Um, we also, we use benches. Um, we don't have like massage chairs or, or, like they're called throne chairs and some people really like those and they're like, our, our benches are specifically designed for pedicures. So it's okay. as comfortable as possible. You know, the, the thighs are supported and all that kind of stuff. We use a great company for that called Michelle pull office. And, um, so they're, they're specifically designed for this. It's not like a, a bus bench or something like that. And they look gorgeous too. But the reason we do that is because our spaces are social spaces. So, um, we don't have screens up on the wall with, you want you know, to foster inter- interactions. Yes, exactly. And it's kind of interesting. Cause like, you know, when I was working in the studio, like Saturdays, it sounds like a party. Like, That's you know, fun. people are laughing, you know, guests are talking to each other Sundays. Um, you know, it's the same amount of people, but it's just like this spa <laughs> vibe, you know, like we're just chilling out, just enjoying my pampering time. So don't funny. talk to me, you know? So we just don't think that would happen, you know, unless because like during bridal parties or, you know, some of those other parties, you know, people want to come talk to the bride or the mother-in-law or like whatever the case may be. And they can do that on our benches, but they couldn't do that. They'd be yeah, kind of you're excluded like from that. Some, and it's uncomfortable yeah. to get back yeah. up. And- yeah. But some people really like those other chairs. And so, you know, we got some feedback on that and we're like, thanks, but we're going to keep on doing this because we think the social dynamic is more important, you know? Yeah. So. That's the beauty with feedback. It's your decision to take it or not. And uh, at least you you analyze the feedback and decide. I mean, Gabe, we, we've unpacked a lot here, whether it's prospective franchisee, franchisors, franchise brokers, business brokers, across, across the spectrum, there, there's a lot yeah. to get from today's conversation. And I'll be sure to include a link to Frenchies and any other information you'd like me to include in the, in the YouTube um, notes sure. and any of these studies, Ivis uh, reports, anything that's on the industry would be great to include in the show notes. Uh, sure. But again, I really enjoyed having you on. I learned a lot about this industry and just a lot of continue to, to learn about franchising in today's call. With you. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity and the chance to talk to you. It's been great. Thanks, thanks. Keith. Appreciate it. All right. Take care.